Thank you all for joining the session. Uh, my name, as I said, is Tim Hudson. I work for a company called Agen. We do payments. We'll get more into that uh, at a moment. Um, I'm here today to uh, talk about embracing empathy. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, empathy and, and my view on empathy, or our view on empathy at Adyen. Um, but first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I studied at St. Martin's College of Art in uh, London. So I started as an artist. I uh, still make paintings. You can see those. I'll show you a link later if you're interested. Um, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about um, how I got into empathy with Adyen. So um, I, I have a little confession to make. I'm talking about empathy. Um, does anybody know what this is? This is an NBI profile. It's kind of a, a profile of your brain and, and, and how you work. And this is not just any MBI profile. Um, this is my MBI profile. And if you, oh, where's this laser gone here? Uh, laser, this one, wow. Uh, if you look at this section here, this says that I'm, I'm actually quite a strategist and uh, imagineer. Uh, I'm quite creative. Um, if you look at this section here, this is about socializer and empathizer. And if you look at this smallest section here, uh, that's about empathy. <clears throat> what it actually says is Tim will most probably not be comfortable in an environment that requires him to be emotionally sensitive and show empathy and support on an ongoing basis. So I hold my hand up. I'm not really empathic. I'm more empathetic. So it doesn't get better than that. So uh, there you go. So I work for a company called Agen. We uh, make payments uh, possible. So we make it possible for your money to get from wherever you want to pay into the merchant's um, uh, bank accounts. Um, it's quite a complicated process. Uh, it, for, for many years, it's been run on traditional rails. Um, we're kind of disrupting or trying to disrupt that whole um, process of getting payments from one place to another. So you see here, this is the, the, what makes us unique, is this is the usual uh, path a payment would take, that a merchant would connect to a gateway. Uh, maybe you've heard of Stripe or some other gateways out there. Um, but what we do is we take all the pieces, so the gateway, the risk, the processing. We are actually a, an acquirer and a processor. So we just make one system, so there's less points of failure, and we can keep the data connected along all the dots all the way. So it's quite good. So if you've got a Netflix account or a Spotify account, um, or you pay on Facebook, you probably pay through Adyen. Uh, we don't only do uh, online sales and e-commerce. We also have moved over the last few years into point of sale. That means that when you go into a Nike store and you buy your shoes, uh, you're also probably um, playing, uh, paying through Adyen. So, uh, in uh, product design, or what was called UX at first, wh where are our touch points? Um, so we make it possible to make these payment pages that you will pay online with, even though we don't make those pages ourselves. We create the framework for people to uh, make those payment pages. We do, have, we do make some uh, just a, what we call the default page. Um, we also provide uh, the, uh, our own software for the terminals that you use to pay in, in stores. So uh, that's one touch point to our customers, that's, and that's to shoppers, let's say. But our main customers, we're strictly business to business. So main, mainly what you would do, and you've heard about icebergs already this morning, we create icebergs. So what does this iceberg represent in terms of Adyen? Well, the tip of the iceberg is what we call the customer area, where our merchants log in and they manage their payments. So they'll manage the risk, they'll manage the users, they can do the case management, that kind of stuff. And underneath the iceberg is what we do operationally inside Agen for our customers. So we can also manage risk. And there's many, many other uh, financial operations uh, that we perform. So that's basically what our product designers and our UXs uh, mainly do at Agen. Internally in Agen, we have built a fantastic engine. And when we talk about uh, our software, um, we often refer to it as an engine. And we say we've built the best engine for payments that there is. Uh, we took the old rails of the payments uh, flow. We've redesigned it from scratch. We're also about 11 years old. 
Um, and we started, you know, we, we often refer to it as, as one of the best engines in the world for payments. So the Maserati engine. So what do we do as UX? Um, well, of course, we try to take this and we make it into something like this. Um, the, the guys who started AdGen are very, very technical, um, really technical. We're not a design thinking company at all, um, or we never were. This is where we're trying to get to, and this is where we're thinking about empathy. Um, so these guys have built like a double booking accounting system. This kind of thing. These are guys who, who look out the window and they don't see a landscape, they see numbers, and it's very difficult for them to produce uh, really nice interfaces. And this is the sort of interface I was faced with when I started working at Adyen um, about five and a half years ago. It's very, very functional. Um, the use of space isn't very good. Um, it's just filling in some, uh, some stuff. So this is what I was faced with uh, to begin with. There was no front-end developers. There were nobody, nobody who knew how to do um, HTML and CSS. There were no UX designers at all. In fact, there wasn't even any design. So this is what uh, I and the team have been doing over the past five years. When I first got there, um, they gave me this. And they said, I said, yeah, we've got to design something. And I went, oh, yeah, a hump of black plastic. Um, that's good. But I want to use Photoshop. This was a Linux machine. I want to use Photoshop and stuff like that. And they said, no, no, you've got GIMP and Inkscape. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, right. So I kind of felt a bit like an island. Um, there's all these really, really intelligent developers developing this you know, functional systems, and here's me saying, no, we've got to make it look pretty, and oh, yeah, it's got to be usable for our customers. People didn't really uh, get that. So, and here you see, this was the environment that we were in, and, and there you see, I brought the first Mac screen into Adyen, woohoo! Um, but you see, it's all black and white, and everybody got these black screens, black desks, and they weren't really in an environment that made them feel like producing something that was um, good looking and, and, and uh, well functioning. So how do we work at Adgen? What we, we, we have this kind of basic set of principles that we call the Adgen formula. Um, and as you see, there's eight of them here. You don't have to read them all. I'm going to pick out a few that are a couple that are important to me to do my job at Adgen. Uh, one thing we say to all our employees is we don't hide behind an email. Instead, we pick up the phone. And that really means, hey, just go and talk to people. Don't you know, waste time. Don't even pick up the phone if they're in the same office. We encourage people to just go and talk all the time. Um, talk at the coffee machine, talk whatever. Uh, don't, do not uh, waste time with red tape or anything like that. Just go see the person. We also say, which was quite difficult for me, um, is we launch fast and iterate. You know, uh, payments is a fast-paced game. Everybody's trying to get in there. Um, so it's about launching fast. And when you think about developing and, and, and making um, UX possible, when you've got something like this built into your core cultures and your core values, um, it's like really, if we're trying to do anything on the front end, it's like trying to change wheels on a fast-moving car. So we're all the time, every month, releasing, releasing, releasing software. The developers, there's 100 developers there, coding, coding, coding. We've got new, no UXers, no uh, um, front-end coders. So this is what our design looked like back in the day. So you know, we went and got some definition, and then we built it. So where does empathy fit in here? Well, it, it doesn't really. I mean, maybe when you're defining it, you can listen to the customers. What do you want? And everybody knows, probably you're, you're all in UX, I assume, or you're developers. And everybody kind of knows that this is the path that we should have. You know, define, research. Now, there's lots of points in here to put empathy into what you're building. But when you've got no time to do that, and when you're trying to sell this to a fast-functioning company, it's quite difficult to get these points in here uh, and get empathy. And, and actually, to do this whole process is quite difficult. So we wanted to start from somewhere a bit smaller. We wanted to start from principles. Just Three simple principles. We want our interface to be intuitive, consistent, and helpful. Right? Um, so this was the kind of interface we were faced with back then. Um, and of course, agenda payments and data is very important. So I've just pick, picked one example out of the whole of what we call the back office and the customer area, just to make a point of what's going on and, and what was going on. So here you see, um, well, 
we had data. Great, and, and not many people did at the time. Uh, not many payment service providers did, but we did. And you see, it looked quite pretty, right? It looks great. It's like lots of colors and stuff, but what's actually going on? If you look at the principles, intuitive and helpful, this actually isn't very intuitive. It's not actually very helpful. But how could I say that to the guys who built it and that these, these guys were think, thinking functionally? So um, if you see here, you know, we've got a graph that's orange and green, but what does it mean? It doesn't say anything. Uh, this doesn't align with this one or this one with this one. So if you're looking at comparisons, that's difficult. Uh, this is some kind of like a pie chart. Don't get me started on pie charts. We'll get to that later. And, and this, what does this tell you? Well, let's assume yeah, we're talking about payments. How are we doing? Well, in the world, it's a map of the world. We're doing pretty green in Europe, if you're not colorblind, and in the rest of the world, pretty shitty brown. But that's OK, they said, because when you roll over, you will see the amount of sessions you've done. And when you roll out again, it disappears. So I said, but you know, people haven't got good short-term memories. How are they going to remember that when you're comparing figures? And they said, oh, we've got good short-term memories. Who's got a good short-term memory here? Has anybody got a good short-term memory? Come on, you must have. Don't be shy. One, no, no, she's scratching her head. Uh, anybody else? Good short-term memory? Well, let's do a test. Let's do a little test, shall we? I'm going to show you a, a, a couple of pictures. I'm going to show you this picture of a house. Um, I'm going to show you another picture of the same house. And it's almost identical, but there is one change right, in this picture. And all I want you to do is just remember this picture in your short-term memory and look at the next picture and see if you can see what's changed. Now, if you have, don't shout out, Ray! You know, that's not going to work, because then you'll ruin it for everybody else. I just want to see, just raise your hand slowly if you've seen what's going on here. So picture number one, picture number two. Did you see what's changed there? Come on, I've only got 25 minutes. Are you ready? We'll go back. Picture number one, did you see it that time? Come on, somebody's got a good short-term memory, for God's sake. And picture number two. Anybody? Oh, somebody saw it. Woo! Well done. We'll stop at one. Um, <laughs> what's actually happening here? I always put kittens in, because that brings empathy for me. So. Um, <laughs> So what's going on here? Did anybody see Men in Black? I've just got this little thing out of my hand, and I've gone and all your memories have just gone like this. Well, no, what's actually going on here is, if you noticed, I put a white blank screen in the middle. So when you look at something, and cognitively, when you see something, your brain doesn't see the whole picture. It sees little parts of the picture. Your eyes dot around, and it builds up this frame in your mind of the picture, and you see what it was. When I put that white screen in the middle, what I'm effectively doing is wiping your short-term memory, because your brain thinks, oh, hang on, forget what I've just seen, and see something else. Right? So that's actually what's happening. Unless you're looking at the exact spot that changes when you've got the white screen, it makes the changeover, you won't actually notice what's going on. And, and I guess none of you really were looking at that spot. Um, so let me show you again, and I'm going to remove that white uh, blank screen. I'm not going to do the men in black thing anymore. Are you ready? Picture one, picture two. Who saw it that time? <laughs> Anybody see it? Anybody not see it? OK. So what we end up with is not a map of the world with green and shitty brown, but we just end up with some bar charts, which clearly show you know, how you're doing in each of the regions. That's a bit more intuitive. It's a bit more helpful to our customers. So um, uh, pie charts. Oh, god. Um, here we go. Pie charts. This is not just a pie chart. This is lying with data. Can anybody see how this is lying with data? Anybody see this? Yeah, a number of people. I'll just point it out. Since when has 19.5 been bigger than 21.2? Yeah, doesn't really work, does it? I, who the hell would want to do that? I have no idea. But moving swiftly on, <laughs> um, <clears throat> we're not very good at looking at circles. Pie charts are not very good, and I try to eliminate them from Agen, and I give everybody this talk uh, as an introduction session, and I say to everybody at Agen, look, look at these circles. Which is the second largest dark green shape there? Can you spot it? Well, you probably can, but it's not that easy, right? Um, to make it more difficult, what I could say is say, take these three 
uh, dark green shapes. I love doing this, by the way. Uh, I wish my cat was here. Right? I, did do that, I did do this presentation for the cat just to practice, and this is where it all broke down. Um, anyway, take these three shapes, and are they bigger or smaller than this shape? Quite difficult to do, right? It's quite difficult because what I'm asking you to do is take a circle. Our brains are not good at looking at circles, and minus another circle and see what's left, right? So that's not really uh, uh, an easy thing to do. Um, but bar charts, height and width, is quite easy to look at, and it's easy for us to judge. Why is that? Everybody just stand up for a minute. Come on, I'm just making sure if you're asleep. Good, good, that took a bit longer than I wanted it to. Just have a look around the room, have a look at your neighbor. Are you taller or smaller than your neighbor? <laughs> look at somebody at the back of the room, and are you taller or smaller? I mean, I'm on the stage, but you can probably guess if you're taller or smaller than me, right? Exactly, you can sit down, thank you. Um, it's instinct. We've got a built-in instinct to know about height and width. Where does that come from? I guess when we're growing up as cavemen and whatever, and there's animals around, anything bigger than us, we want to run away, and anything smaller, we want to kill and eat. So there we go. It's kind of built in. So it's a lot easier for people to see bar charts. So just use bar charts. It's a lot more intuitive, right? Now, if, if you want to create empathy for yourself, right? So if Adyen didn't want to, what I'm trying to do is make Adyen employees empathize with our customers. Right? Now, if I want our customers to empathize with Adyen, that's the, completely the other way around, I could use pie charts. Even though I hate them and I think they're not very intuitive, um, I could use them. Like in something like infographics, why would I do that? Why does a pie chart create empathy the other way around? Well, if you think about it, we like circles. We're not very good at judging them, but we like them. Why do we like circles? Anybody know? Well, we've got round faces and round eyes, and we like to look at round faces and round eyes, right? The bigger and rounder the face and rounder the eye, the more empathy... Oh. <laughs> oh. Moving swiftly on. So, <clears throat> what do we do at Agen? Well, our, our, we call them product designers now, are all split into streams. And uh, we tell people in these streams, so we've got a, a different product designer on each stream. Um, we've got fraud and risk and data and reporting. And we, we go through and we, we tell people these things. And we say, look, we want to be not a functional company. Here's the ladder to product success. You may have seen this, may not. You know, we want to move from functional to usable and comfortable. We want to make that experience delightful and meaningful if we can um, with, with our software. What does that mean? How do we show them what that means? Well, I don't know if you're familiar with thermostats, but this is an example of something that's functional and something that's maybe classed as meaningful or delightful to use. Why is that? Well, this, you just press the buttons and it makes your radiators come on when you want. This one learns when your radiators come on, and it even provides a night light when you walk to the bathroom at night. So how do we get our product there? How, how, how do we try to do that? Well, here's one thing that we've done with terminals. We've just taken a, a, a not-so-nice interface, and we've tried to uh, you know, think about all that kind of stuff, um, and we've built it into our, our, our terminals. Have we got sound? This is another interface that we have. Um, and if you see, this is the kind of settings that we'd have before. Um, you know, just lots of stuff to fill in, lots of ticks. And now we're working with a design system, our own design system that we call the Agian Design Language. Um, and we've tried to put some more information there. It's not just a tick box. We've tried to add some information and that kind of stuff in there. So this is what the design system looks like. It starts in Sketch. Then we get our very experienced developers to build this as a library so the other front-end developers can go on and use this. But I have an important question. Why did I make you stand up a minute ago? Why did we do the um, exercise with memory? Right? What I'm trying to do here, and this is what I put our our developers through, and everybody who works at Agen, 
I'm doing that because I want you to experience exactly what I'm talking about. It's okay to tell people and show people and make them sit there and see this uh, thermostat and understand it. But when you stand up now, when you stood up, hopefully you'll remember, oh, I'm using more of um, you know, touch, smell, sight, sound, thinking, oh yeah, that was about pie charts. I shouldn't use pie charts. And that memory test, I'm making you empathize with the user. Because when the user has got to uh, actually click and remember all the you know, um, data when they're rolling in and rolling out, that doesn't hit home until you make somebody do it. Until I prove to you, hey, cognitively, you're not very good at this stuff, so let's think about the user. So this is how we're trying to uh, bring empathy uh, within Agent. I talked to you about the environment that we worked in, and I showed you that it was all black and white computers. One thing that we've been doing is making our offices look nicer. You know, these people from Google, and you see all these uh, you know, sleep pods at Google and that kind of thing, great environments. And we're like, why can't we have that environment? So this has really worked. These are our offices around the world. We've now got 14 offices. You see Singapore, New York, San Francisco. Um, but we try and make them look beautiful, so people working there uh, are surrounded by good design. We've started to do design sprints. There was a workshop yesterday, very good on design sprints. Who knows what design sprints are? Great. They are very useful. We've, we didn't, last time I gave this talk, we'd not started doing them. I've recently done five or six design sprints, and they've been absolutely wonderful. If you can get the buy-in. Now, the buy-in is quite difficult, because I took this to our um, you know, strategy team, and I said, we've got to do design sprints. This is going to be great. And they looked at this. I told them about this book. And you know what they saw? This. Five days. <laughs> five days with a team of people. Gosh, we launch fast, we iterate. Yes, I know, I know. But look, this is going to be so useful. Um, what I did do is a bit of research, and there's some very smart people called AJ and Smart from Berlin. Uh, big up to them. They were fantastic. They've been working with the design sprints for a long time, and they've made Design Sprints 2.0. So if you're going to use Design Sprints, please look at this, because it's only four days. <laughs> but it's not four days with all the expensive people. Because this was the old system, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you'd make your sketch, you'd decide the whole group is there for the first three days, um, and then you'd prototype and test on Friday. This is Design Sprint, design sprint 2.0. You get it all done, you prototype on Wednesday, and test on Thursday. This has been very successful at Agent. It, it, it's great. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, you can see when we do the user testing on these design sprints and stuff, we've actually set up two rooms where we film the, the person being, uh, doing the test, we film the screen as well, and we have that beam to another room, and we get everybody from the team, developers and everything, watching that and, and going through that with the, with the people. That's also very useful, and they all make notes, and then they can see their wonderful ideas, how shit they were, or whatever, the other way around. Um, but anyway, what we've also done is we've talked about our developers. We've also made a code of conduct for our developers. You don't have to read this as well. I'm just going to point out a couple that I managed to squeeze in there. OK, there's a lot of kind of uh, guide uh, guidelines here. But the two that are really important to me are we think like a merchant, so go and meet them. We want everybody in our company to go and meet the merchants. And a product is only finished when it has a face and is validated with a live customer. And oh, it's a wrap. Thank you. <laughs> we, uh, we do have a stand if you want to come and talk to us. Um, you see Nick, the head of product design, is there. We've got Thomas, uh, who's our design system developer. We've got Lisa Lott. If you're interested in a job, come and talk to us. Uh, am I allowed to say that? Anyway, I just did. And you can see here, uh, we've got a tech blog at Medium. Um, we've got careers, if you're interested. And this Instagram, the secret code machine, is mine if you want to see the paintings. Thank you very much. Great. Great talk, Tim. You. Can you hang out for just a few minutes? We might yes. have a few questions. Oh, yeah. Geez. I think we have a few time, a few minutes for questions. Um, anybody have a question for Tim? Let's see if we can see back there. No. Nope. No question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you guys, I have a couple questions. So you, you, yeah. uh, you guys recently IPO'd, is that right? We did. You did. So has that changed the, I mean, that's a big step for any company. I know you guys have been around for 11 years now. Uh, has that changed any of your thinking? Is that... Anything that happens in the design group or the UX or the product team 
we knew we were going to do the IPO for a long time. It had been on the cards for a long time. And uh, Peter, our CEO, um, spoke to everybody about it before we did it. And he was very clear. IPO means nothing to us. It's just the shareholders we had, who we didn't know, being changed for sh different shareholders that we don't know. Right. So it means nothing to us on a daily basis. All it means is we've got different shareholders. Uh, and it's another day as usual. So no, the IPO hasn't changed anything the way that we work. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, and when did you join the company? I joined uh, five and a half years ago, March 2013. Great, so about halfway yeah. through the company's life. Yeah. yeah. And have you seen, were there any metrics that you used to judge the success of your uh, implementation of more customer empathy? It's good because getting metrics on what we do, because there, weren't, there, there were no metrics at the start. So we've introduced systems like an internal system. Because we're in payments, we can't use any cloud systems. So um, the data is very precious, so we're not using Google Analytics. But we've got an internal uh, data metric system for our back office. So we're using that. Of course, support tickets are a great metric. So now we've got full access. All designers have got full access to all support tickets. Um, and you can go and you can look at those in Looker and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, this is this is uh, changed now. Yeah. That's great. Uh, any questions? Yeah, we have some questions. Great. Let's get a mic over here. And state your name and company as well. Hi. Good. Um, my name is Charles. Hi, Charles. Uh, I'm a UX researcher at Primerica. So uh, I want to go back to your point about pie charts and how confusing they are to interpret. And then you. you you recommended we use bar graphs instead, and then you showed us a photo of a puppy, and now we, <laughs> we, we, feel, uh, we feel empathy towards that puppy, and so now I, I'm kind of lost. So okay, sorry. Are I, circles I, good now? <laughs> no, no, no. So uh, the point was that I was trying to make, and I, I was t in two minds whether to remove those two slides or not, so I'm glad that you pointed this out. Um, you know, what I'm trying to do at Adyen is build empathy from within, so within the iceberg, to our customers. The point with the, with the pie charts is they would make our customers empathize towards us. So if we put out some infographics with pie charts on or circles, our customers would then empathize towards us. So if you want to do that, that's a good way to do it. I still don't think pie charts are very good. What, what I'm trying to do is make our team empathized towards our customers. So it's just a bit of a switch around. Sorry if it was confusing. Yeah, Is that great. clear now? Does that, anybody else want to pick me up on pie charts? <laughs> <laughs> great question. Uh, any other questions out there? Yeah, one more in the back there, or a couple. And remember, state your name and your company. Hi, this is Javier from OnTrack. I'm the Chief Product Officer. Um, I was wondering, how do you combine design sprints with the regular work? Um, it's like a, it's very similar. Um, we, we, well, we say design sprints are a tool. You can use them if you want. So the streams are set up in such a way that we have a, a two leaders of the stream. We have a product lead and a tech lead. Um, we've got front-end and back-end developers and business strategists in there. Um, and I've been touting the de design sprints because I thought they were a good idea. But we've we by no means enforced them. And before anybody takes a design sprint ad in, I have to make sure that they've filled in um, really just a, a, a little thing to make me know that they're serious about it, that they're going to put the time in and the effort, and that they're going to do the homework before. So they need to find the experts to speak. They need to um, make sure they've got the resources to carry on with whatever we've designed in the design sprint. So there is a lot of conditions that we do when we say, look, these are the conditions, and I'm not going to let you do a design sprint unless you do that. So we kind of build it in. So the, the, the pauses where a design sprint would naturally fit in would be when they've finished a major product project and they get to the end of a release. Time's up, time's up. Um, the, when they get to a release and they're embarking on the next new project, that would be a good time, depending on how big the project was, to do a design sprint. So we want it to fit in naturally. We don't want to force anybody to do it. Great and question. I think that's it. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Remember to check out his art. <laughs>